Good evening. In times where bureaucrats take over the whole world, destroying what they don't know, namely the profile of the image, taming all wild, unpredictable things, believing that they know what they really don't know, in these times it's good to have Jeffrey Kipnis with us. Jeffrey is one of the last partisans of the architectural scene. Coming from the wild channel of the crisscross thinking and unforeseen processes of design. If someone would ask me how I can describe Jeffrey Kittness, I would like to compare it with an iceberg. As we know, only one seventh of the iceberg can be seen. So, what can we see? If we look at Jeffrey Kipnis, Kipnis was born in 1951. Young guy, actually. 1951. He is well educated. <laughs> he is an architectural critic, theorist, designer, and educator. This is what we can see. He taught and is teaching on all important architectural schools all over the world, like Columbia, Harvard, and the Architectural Association, and in our school. He's a professor at the Ohio State University, yeah. and currently teaching at SIAC in Los Angeles. What we can't see, and this is maybe the dangerous part of him, look at the Titanic which was slashed by the invis invisible part of the iceberg, is that he holds a master's degree in physics, that he's a very good piano player, besides he is playing Mozart much too fast, and that he is a filmmaker and a curator at the Wexner Center for Arts in Columbus, also in Jeffrey Kipnis, is, as far as I know, the only one of, in the field of architecture theory who can really compare the dancing of a mungo with a cobra with a relevant design process. He's really the only one who can, who can do that. And he's a great critic. He is crystal clear and comes right to the point. Good students like that, sloppy students not. But his crystal clearness is not shining like a diamond, it's rather sharp like a razor blade. The first time I got to know him was through a photograph hanging at the A in AIA in New York. One could see Peter Eisenman surrounded by students listening to a guy who obviously ruled the whole conversation. Do you know this longer? They were a little bit younger then, uh, shaved, big head, but ruling the conversation like you always do. Um, and when I asked uh, the guys around, who is this guy? They said, how come that you don't know Jeffrey Kittens? Now I know him and I'm very thankful he supported the school the last couple of years. But I have to mention that it was very difficult to bring him here this time, more difficult than to bring owls to the Danube or water to acid. I just learned that Jeffrey will talk about the architectural competition for this school, and he told me that he doesn't like my project the best. <laughs> then, I don't mind, because I know that my project is for sure the best project. <laughs> <laughs> and secondly, when critics describe an architectural piece, they only describe themselves. Please join me in welcome Jeff Kipper.
you all. That was a lovely introduction. Um, I, it's funny that he didn't introduce himself that day, I guess. Um, I don't remember when I met Wolf, but I do remember it took a long time that I avoided him. Um, during the deconstruct of his show, his was the work I didn't understand and didn't think I would ever understand. I actually thought it was artistic engineering. Yeah. Um, and the reason for that was is uh, I didn't know anything about Vienna. I didn't know anything about the culture of Vienna. And later on, there's only one architect of all the group of architects you may think about it who, that I associate with, the deconstructive architectures, and the, the, there's only one that has taken me longer to appreciate than Wolf. And that's Eric Moss, who I've just come to appreciate. <laughs> We've been friends for 25 years, but I finally sat down and studied his work. But for one reason or another, I started to pay attention to Wolf. I've met Wolf. Usually I don't like to meet the architect um, because you can become, you can like the person, it becomes very difficult to understand the work. But as I met Wolf and I understand the politics of architecture and what architecture means here and what the situation is in Vienna and Austria, I, get, I became profoundly moved by his architecture. And, uh, started to really, his theory of two gravities, or at least I call it the theory of two gravities. For some reason he loves cantilevers, that part I don't quite understand. That, although that little column that sticks up in Korea is fantastic. But the other gravity um, is the gravity that you can, you, we all cause. Spiritual gravity, intellectual gravity, um, and it takes quite a, quite an adventurous mind to actually think that architecture, instead of imposing it, can relieve it. That you can use architecture to release the gravity as opposed to make it worse. And I think that was a really incredible thing. So I just want to thank you for it. It's really been important to my career so, and the work. Okay, so the name of this lecture is Why Bother? I don't know if it, it made the poster. And it really is the question of, you know, after 40 or 50 years of uh, avant-garde and manager architecture, even going back to the restaurant pollution, so let's say over 100 years. Um, why bother? Why bother to, to make people irritated with architecture? Why bother to do anything? What's the point? What's the, you know, 40 or 50 I mean, it, For me, this is the most important page in architectural history. And have all of you read this? No. I said, I doubt even you know what this book is or who the author is. Uh, it's okay. It's from a long time ago. It, he was a contemporary of Vitruvius. I don't know. It's a long line. But when every time you see a, a book that says architecture or revolution, uh, if you aren't excited, then you are in the wrong place. No matter how naive that sounds, for anybody to seriously write, for Corbusier to write, that if we don't use architecture correctly, we will face a revolution. Then he doesn't actually say architecture can cure the revolution. He can act, what he actually says is without the right attitude towards architecture, a revolution is And I find that incredibly moving. Um, no matter how naive it was. This is 1949. It's obvious very naive. I think it was clearly naive. Although, I think understanding, if you're in this audience and you cannot say in two or three sentences why he made that claim, absolutely crystal clear. If you don't know it, like you know, like a physicist knows Newton's three laws, then there's some problem. Now, that problem may be like you. May, like I said, he may be naive, he may, not, he may not fully grasp the situation, but if you don't understand the claim, you have no business in architecture, in my opinion. You're perfectly welcome to design and build buildings as a service practice. Uh, that's good, that's fine, I like that. And we'll talk about service practices. Now, about, it only took 35 years before we got to this. 35 years since architecture. 
this looks really different than this. But this is a balance. This worked 3,000 projects in 10 years. All of them moved. 100% of them moved. Does anybody know why? Because it's the same subject. Architect, uh, what Corbusier thought architecture served the, the idea of land. That the classical architecture, or the architecture as it, as it worked from the Renaissance to the 20th century, thought it established the land as land. Ground that the, that the building sat on was reinforced in its status as land by the architecture. Now there's a big difference between land and ground. Ground is a thing you build on, you walk on, whatever. Land is a thing you kill people. This land is our land, homeland security. Land is the saturation of the ground with politics. It starts in feudalism, it starts with serfdom, and then it, it, it's retained in capitalism. So the most uh, conspicuous retention from feudalism to capitalism is the status of the land and law. Uh, in, if you were a serf, you actually belonged to the ground. You couldn't be bought or sold. Uh, if you were a slave, the difference was you could be bought or sold. You, were per you changed from real property, real property is anything attached to the land, to personal property, which is anything you can carry with you. Now, interestingly enough, buildings are the only object that I know of that everyone relates to as personal property when in fact they're real property. So, this question of how architecture can relax its relationship to the land starts in Le Corbusier. He actually uses the five points to change it into datum. There's a big difference between datum and land. If you say the word datum and land as if you, they mean the same thing, then you're missing the point. By this time, the naivetes of uh, uh, Le Corbusier are clear. So every project by these guys, by Archigram, by House Rooker, most of the projects by the inflatable movement, architecture confable, the so I've been about all that bouncing around in balloons had to do with trying to overcome architecture's relationship to instantiated oppressive power, even if it had to do it, even if it had to do it through performance art. Any way you could do it. Uh, and that came down to one statement by, by a French, a French philosopher sorry, named Bataille. And he basically said, architecture will always serve power cannot ever not serve power. And so this has been the problem. So why I'm saying to you as students, uh, why bother, is if you don't have that relationship to the work, then I don't know what you do. And then, then you're just a stylist, and that's okay. Like I said, it's okay to be a stylist. It's okay to make fun of interesting things. But if, if it's true, what Wolf said, that, that I'm the last partisan, then I'm glad of it, because not only do I believe, it works, I believe I can show you how it works. So these are the buildings. This is the pod. So now, just for your knowledge, in case you come to school and you thought you were going to learn something about how to practice architecture, and no one talking about how to practice architecture, I'm going to teach it to you right now. <laughs> these are the values that every developer and every client expresses as their most desirable features. It codes meaning you follow the law. And then cost, comfort, convenience, familiarity, pride, and pleasure. Like if you just make a building that they recognize, that's soft on the inside, hard on the outside, like the three little pigs, that when you show when you show everybody your big mansion, they say, wow, that's a fantastically great mansion, then you're going to be a successful architect. And you never learn it. I, I, dare, I, dare, I doubt seriously you know how to do any of these things for good reason. Uh, they're easy to do. You, just, you can go to any hardware store and buy a book. Now, let's say you want to know something about how to approach the problem of context. So, I've, there's this, this thing, here's the list for, this is called dental contextualism. This is how an architect works as a contextualist. So let's say this is a bad context. <laughs> what you don't want is a Peter Eisen in tooth. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want a Frank Gehry. You want, Every tooth to be the right color, the right height, and so they, these are the rules. 
Use the established time form. Use adjacent to determine height. Use adjacent to determine color. Fill in any gaps. There you go. <laughs> now, I tell you what, you'll be a very successful practitioner, but you will not <laughs> stop revolutions. Now, here's a context that I'm interested in. This is one of the worst contexts. This was the University of Cincinnati. You won't know it. This is 30 years ago. They started to build buildings there. They got a master planner named George Hargreaves to do a master plan. All the architects have basically ignored them. And so over the years, they built these. And so if I, if I might, so this is Peter Eisler's building, I think. This is Don Main. Don Main turns the football field into this. This is uh, Michael Graves. This is Bernard Schumi. And what you'll notice is they start to hold together in an entirely new way. Each building reacts to the other building. So Peter makes that curve, and then Tom makes the curve. And then uh, Michael makes the uh, uh, French and Michael building, and then Tom makes and ends the fourth one. And so, get, so they, they hold together in a complex, evolutionary way. And it's not like dental contextualism. It doesn't actually. Uh, make you go, you know, but this actually does real work. So look at this, look at the football stadium at the time. It's an incredible thing. And then you can see this fourth court where Michael Graves is building is completed by Thompson. So there is a way that building, that, that, so the differences start to work together in the kind of genetics that's far more intimate, I think, and more interesting. Now, these are two of my favorite people, and I'm going to draw a relationship to them. Wolfland, I think, I don't know if you know, he was a Swiss uh, art historian. However, he never called himself an art historian. He called himself a psychologist. So whenever he wrote Principles of Art History, or Renaissance and Baroque, when he wrote about architecture, he wrote about it as if he was a psychologist. And he said something funny uh, in, the, in the book, and there's a, the reason I put, put this out is, there's a, the Vienna School of Art History is called the Scientific School. It wanted to discuss how art, uh, with not a question of style, not a question of experience, but how art was actually produced as a kind of scientific version of history, and Wolfland was his adversary. Now, in 1888, Wolfland wrote a book called Renaissance and Baroque, and he basically said the point of architecture is to teach us about our bodies as the place where our spirit lives. Our, he, didn't, he didn't actually mean religious, but he actually meant our psychology. So he saw the Renaissance as teaching us that the body has part of whole relationships, the proportions, and consinity. And he saw the Baroque as actually noticing that the, even though that's a hand and this is an arm, they're connected. And that connection is what the Baroque is about. The Baroque is about breaking down part of whole relationships in perception and emphasizing them as atmosphere. And those are the terms he uses. Atmosphere and perception are born in Renaissance and Baroque in 1888. Twelve years later, Freud goes to Paris. He studies uh, hypnosis with Charcot. And he has this breakthrough idea, many people consider this the greatest idea in the intellectual history of psychology. He notices that people that have real paralysis of their hand, these muscles atrophy. If you are really unable to use your hand, these two muscles in your arm will waste away, will rot because uh, they're not, they're, the nerve sensations are gone. But if you have a hysterical paralysis, if you have a psychological paralysis of your hand, and you, and you can know that because people with uh, psychological or hysterical paralysis will often temporarily lose, temporarily lose their paralysis in hypnosis, then these two muscles don't atrophy. And the reason for that is, is most people don't think of these two muscles as part of their hand, only an anatomist when dissecting out a hand would dissect out these two muscles. So as far as the mind is concerned, what gets paralyzed is this thing from here up, the word hand. And so this idea that our material life is constantly teaching us about our body and a relationship to our mind and our psychology, I think is anticipated in Wolfland. The, the, the thought by Freud is clearly anticipated in the analysis of the Renaissance and Baroque by Wolfland. And that's where I think I get my idea from. Now, today we're not talking about just the body, but we approach the problem of architecture as a problem of philosophy, as a problem of politics, and as a problem of psychology. Not as a problem of science. There's not one scientific bit of knowledge in all of architecture. The minute anybody knows anything scientific about architecture, it stops being architecture.
It becomes like, for example, who was the first architect to use electricity in a building? Have you ever studied the history of electricity in buildings? As, as soon as it becomes something that valuable, that repeatable, it stops being architecture. So we study something, I'm going to teach you what we study in that. So, this is the architecture. Now this is The Shining, you know the movie The Shining? I, uh, now, if you're a good, like in my class, you have to explain why the building looks like that. It usually takes them about, I have to show them this picture. So if I show them this picture, they can't get it. If I show them this picture, they say, oh, it looks like a mountain. Same color as the mountain. This is, this is dental contextual. Right color, right height. But more, and, and this is every architect that I know, this is their favorite scene. Uh, Jack Nicholson is looking at the hedge maze as if he was God looking at a plant. And it's a, it's a picture of total control and domination and beautiful geometry. And actually, in the movie, if you remember when he looks out the window, there is the light. But something else is going on in the movie I think is incredibly interesting. Each character in the movie has a proper psychological space. As long as Jack is in the big public rooms, everything's fine. Uh, Shelley Duvall likes the domestic spaces. And the little boy, let me see if I got him. And the little boy, I don't have the picture, but he likes to ride up and down the hallways and to go and stuff like that. Things go bad when, when Shelley Duvall shows up in the wrong space. Or there's a little boy. When, every, when there, anybody's in the wrong space, here's Jack trying to get the little boy to come out of the interstitial spaces into the bedroom. And the little boy didn't want to do it. So anytime the psychological character, character of the architect isn't meeting the character of its expectation, things go wrong. And that actually, I think, is a really good model, a good way of understanding the way architecture works as far as I'm concerned. And if you remember correctly, um, Here's Jack. <laughs> Here's Johnny. Uh, he can't quite get through the interstitial space. The little boy runs out. And if you'll notice, he's about to be killed with an axe. And he goes into a cupboard. But of course, Jack doesn't know that the cupboard is a space. So he just walks by. And what ends up happening is he runs out to the hedge maze. And Jack is trying to kill him and kill him. And as he's running through the hedge maze, Jack sees a wall. And the little boy runs through the wall, finds a hole in the wall. And so, that's the uh, model I want to introduce tonight. So just quickly, I want to show you. Now, people like science. I know it's a big deal. This. I'm going to show you two things from Scientific American. This is what I think, how I think actually architecture works. This is an article on how you make, how expertise is born. What do you need to know? So here's a couple of things. Uh, When you, look, when you thumb through the article, there's an article about how chess players become great chess players. And there's just two things I want to point out. Look. Read this. Okay. It takes 10 years of approximately a decade. It takes 10 years of heavy labor to master any field. So this idea that you're born a chess genius, it's just bullshit. You gotta work your butt off and you gotta learn the history of the games, not because the history is so interesting because it's a great history, but because it's teaching you the possibilities of your game. And if you don't know the game, you can't play. And the game of chess isn't how the pieces move. The game of chess is the patterns of winning and power struggles that uh, evolve over time. And that's why this little section here, this section here says that if you take two people, if you take a board, this, there's, there's 32 pieces on a chess set. If you take a game that's been played, any game that's been played, following the rules, until there's 16 pieces left, and you show that board to any grandmaster, and then you show that same board to, to any amateur, the grandmasters will always know the best play because they'll recognize the game, they'll recognize the position, and they'll have the best strategy. If you take the same number of pieces and you put them on a board at random, Neither one of them plays better. The master cannot play any better than the amateur. So if you don't know the game, and you don't know what's at stake, and you don't know how it works, you can't do it. And you can sit around and move and make the moves. Anybody can make the moves of a chess game, and anybody can build a building. For God's sake, all you can do is walk around this town and see if anybody can build a building. Or you should come to my town. Look outside and tell me how good that is how interesting, or even how confident those buildings are. It, it, 
it's easy. It's actually quite easy to do. But now here's the second thing I think. I just want to make sure you understand. These are from scientific magazines. This is my favorite. This is about magic. Okay, and it, what this is, is they got one of the, uh, Apollo Robbins is a, like the greatest living magician. And 15 of the top neuroscientists in the world invited him to come into a lecture just like this and explain to him how he did his dreams. Because they thought he uses the science of neurology to do his tricks. And while he was explaining it to him, and he was talking it to him, and he was walking around this and at the end of the lecture, he comes up, he has all of their watches, all of their, uh, he has everything else. So they're sitting there, understanding it scientifically, and he completely pulls it up. And what he does is he knows stuff like this. You see? It's set on a diagonal, so when it, it actually is trying to force this building to be torn down so that the, it can sit on the, in a relationship with the park. This is a major park thoroughfare in Los Angeles. And so, and you walk through it, and so it has this axial entry, and what it has is a, it uses the, the language of that weak form to gather the disparate forces of the city together in a new kind of unity. Uh, and, and, but then you get inside and you find this concert, you find this uh, auditorium. And everybody hates this auditorium, too symmetrical. You've heard this? Like, how can you do such an incredibly interesting building? So I prefer that they, I mean, maybe Frank Gehry is an idiot. I've known Frank a long time. It is a possibility. Everybody that knows Frank, man, he's not an idiot in terms of architecture, but yeah, sometimes when he explains something, he can never explain it. So two things seem really weird. It seems incredibly symmetrical and bizarre. Um, there's one other thing, uh, you know, so, then when I'm looking at the interior of Frank's, and then it starts to remind me, that window in particular that I'm there starts to remind me of that one on the right, and the one on the right is Sherwood. Now, Sharoon is facing a different situ situation than Frank Gehry. Sharoon has to design a building in Berlin, in post-World War in 1950, in which two things are, uh, you have to know. One, you, one is architecture has played an incredibly important role in the politics of the Third Reich, and the other one is music dance. Those are the two art forms that the Third Reich used most successfully um, to produce a kind of fascism, uh, violent fascism. So he has to build that. He has to build a concert hall in, in Berlin. And so, having been an expressionist, he goes back to, he decides to build in the language that belongs to Berlin before buildings. So it's the mountains, the color of the clay, it's a kind of naturalized architecture. To go back and celebrate Berlin as a field, as an urban field, but not to repeat the architecture uh, that produced either the architecture that generated the Nazi experience or the architecture of the Nazi experience. And actually, it, it's, you can see where it's located. It's next to, arguably, and I think I'm right, the single worst building ever built in my <laughs> The only building I know that it, it's like a vampire, the minute you start to walk here, you can feel your, the, value of your life being sucked at <laughs> I'm glad y'all know that because it is really just horrible and then to put it there like what a great idea. You know what? We got this here, we got the Beast National Gallery here. Let's put that Sony experience. Hell it yawn uh should stay as you got it. So I won't belabor this. But what he did, I think what Sharoon does is so incredible. Not only is this a, not, a, it's a kind of language, it's, it's a familiar language and it's unfamiliarity, but he does these things. There are four, there are four floors of seating, but there are 16 trays of seating. So each seating level requires four times as many staircases to get to it. You never know where you are, you cannot look out into the city. All you can see is the light of the city. You cannot actually see the city. And then you get inside, you go through this incredible warrant. If you ever, if you ever gone to a concert there, you have to, actually, you have to beg the ushers to help you. Please help me, please help me. And then you get in there and you get this fantastic uh, array so that there is no such thing as a group of people sitting as a group with any other member of the group. Everybody, all the groups are broken up into small communities. It, it's not allowed to form a collective, a fascist collective. 
And, and it's, it's, it's really fantastic. It has a, it has a convex symmetry instead of concave symmetry, so there's a line that comes through it. This is the organ. These are the best, these are the seats that are the highest seats in the back. These to be the royal seats. They're the worst seats in that. So the entire idea of this building is to produce an experience of music that will not produce a, a single-minded collective. It's impossible. And that's why he really didn't care about the acoustics. He knew the acoustics was going to be there. It's, it's, and to go there is to be, is to, is to engage in one of the most moving, moving, moving musical experiences you can ever have, even though it's not a great uh, auditorium to, to listen to. Now, here, uh, what does this thing look like? Anybody know what that thing looks like? Like from ancient Rome, where you look on the back, that's, it looks like a fashion. And if you look on the first country after Rome to use the fascia as its national symbol, does anybody know? I know you know. Was the United States. We have it on our dime. E pluribus unum is our motto. During World War II, we refused to take it off the dime. We stuck to it. We are a fascist. And now the world knows it. <laughs> The problem with Berlin, I and mean, the problem with Los Angeles, is it's the most broken apart city on earth. It has the most number of unlisted funds, it has 30 separate languages, it is the most fragmented community in the entire world, I think, of, in any major city. And so I think what Frank is doing is using the language of uh, Sharoon to do exactly the opposite politics. He, he, it's exactly the same language on the outside, in other words, it's all about Everybody coming from different directions, and you know, the, the, it's very much like the massing. Massing on the outside is like gathering together the, those buildings and connecting to these buildings. So what he's doing on the inside is temporarily putting an audience together in a coherent whole as a community. Now, does that work? Does it actually? Can we go around and take a, a poll or take a, a? Is there some way to prove that works? The answer is no. It works like magic, but it works. Okay, so. This, uh, would you say that this building is happy to be in Portugal? <laughs> I would say the evidence is it doesn't want to even touch the place. <laughs> Here's what it does. Here's what it decides to sit on. And to make sure you get it, it never lets its new ground touch that ground. So this is a project which is what I would call a metropolitan field project. It, it has a spaceship landing, entry and exit. All the interiors are sarcastic, cynical quotations of the local craft in really bad ways. Look, look at the trouble it goes to make sure this thing is there, but isn't there. So this is a building that's actually a, a new idea about the field, the metropolitan field, which is no longer about the local urban field. But it's about the idea that we together constitute a community, but we aren't located in a place. So this is about being, bringing the no-placeness of the world into architecture in this place. Language is no, nothing at all like that. Now, that brings us to this project. How many of you like this project or don't like this I love this project. Uh, because this is the project that's finally given me an idea of something after the metropolitan field. This is the cosmopolitan field. <laughs> and there's a fictional field we're going to get to it. Um, clearly, Nouvelle cannot stand either Copenhagen or Denmark or wherever it is. This building is all about not being there at all. Like, it literally is it's a temporary, it's, it's shielded in a temporary construction screen as if it's not. You know, it's just getting ready to package to go someplace else. Uh, it's actually, it has a surprising similarity to the Sharoon, both in its formal language and in its seating. So, but the difference is when you walk inside, to the Sharoon, excuse me, is it, you're, it's above you. So, this is a building that when you come in, instead of entering the building, you, you go in it and then you look up. And you, you go up, it's, it's six floors above you. Yeah, you take those escalators. That's what the top, that's the front of the building, so to speak. So the bottom of the building, finally finishing the project, 
where Corbusier starts with the five points, is now the, is now the front facade of a building that's absolutely not about not having any relationship to the context at all as a positive political act in relationship to a community of music. So that's how I see buildings. I just did that quickly. I don't mean it to be. Um, and this is what I just got to discussing. So basically, a, a short history of the land, of the, of the architecture's relationship to power is its relationship to the ground. And that goes from land to datum to field, the urban field, metropolitan field, and cosmopolitan field. Brings us here. <clears throat> when I was going to come last year, the, the title of this lecture is What the Fuck is Wrong with Vienna? <laughs> I, I was so pissed off. You know, I, had, I was going to be the guy, I actually thought. I was going to be the guy that saved, not just architecture in Vienna or the school, that saved all of Vienna. <laughs> I thought, lots of people tried, Mozart, Beethoven, lots of people, I thought, I'm going to do it because I got, I'm going to come in, I'm going to change the school, I'm going to, and Vienna is going to become the city it always should have been and always was despite its best efforts. Vienna has been an incredible city despite all of its efforts not to be it. <laughs> um, like kicking all of its best people out, or not recognizing good people that are visiting, or claiming people that didn't go there, like they claim them. Anyway, so I, I, just, <laughs> I, I decided to look at this thing. I, I thought this is really interesting scheme, and, I, and I'm now going to look at it and tell you my thoughts about the competition from the point of view of the, the theory of the ground. And that's just it. So I don't know about the functionality of these schemes. I, my sense of them is that the parties of them are pretty much the same. Basically, everybody has a, an idea of build uh, on the bad building, which I guess you get permission for. I don't think the bad building is so bad, by the way. I think it, it's much better than anybody wants to give it credit for. And only one building, only one of the entries, shows it any respect whatsoever, and that's Wolf's. Um, so this is the winning scheme, and I'm looking at the scheme, and I'm thinking to myself, First of all, you have to know something else. I, I really want to see big place. I hate, I've grown to hate glass and architecture. I think this is the cheapest trick you can pull. This is Odile deck. Like, let's say you want to make a contextual piece, you show a fake wall, you put some glass on, you reflect the, the, the history back. It is, this is not good magic. This is like really bad magic. This is like this. <laughs> I look out, I look out my window at the Sabatel Hotel, and all I see is reflected everything. Right? Like, if you really want to make a building deep, spatially deep, make it open. So, but no, I, I like Trapeller's scheme. I mean, it has a lightheartedness. But I'm trying to figure out that it has all these references to House Rooker, to uh, Archigram, and yet it doesn't seem to know the politics at all. Like, what's the? Why is transparency? the right approach to this problem. And actually, if you subtract all of the, and I hate to call them gimmicks, they are gimmicks, but there's nothing wrong with a gimmick. But if you subtract the balloons and all this stuff, there really isn't any architecture. There's just a structural system and a wavy piece of glass. And after you value engineer out all of the gimmicks, you're going to value engineer out the wavy piece of glass. And you're just going to have that other building there that's now thicker. <laughs> so. But he can draw, or I mean, it's a, it's a pro I like it. I mean, I have to say, I was ready not to like the project. I've known Wolfgang Chappeller for a long, known Chappeller for a long time. I met him when I first came to Vienna when he had just finished the Floyd Museum. I like him personally. I think he's done some good work. I think this project is striking me as not knowing a game. Like, wouldn't it be cool? This is like Wayne's World. Wouldn't it be cool if we remembered our history a little bit by putting some. Uh, Stuff that kind of looks like bubbles, kind of flawed architecture, inflatable, a little bit of balloons, some media stuff, but not just like an amateur playing a game, nothing at stake. Really, it's for me a project that basically answers the question why bother with there is no reason to bother. Project I think is more interesting. It, it, it also, it's so. It's kind of a, I mean, I think I could imagine this project in another situation and have it be more interesting. It's so tenuous in its contact with the, it almost doesn't want to be there. And so that belongs.
points to a sort of, I don't know, trepidation on the part of architects. Architects do two things. They actually, they don't want to really acknowledge that anyone else is a success in their field. It is the most, it's the pettiest profession I've ever met in my entire life. Like, if you say there are famous architects that are great architects, almost every architect I'll know say, well, they're not. Why, what makes Frank Gehry great? You know, it's as if a, a physicist would say, well, you know, what made Einstein so great? You know, he just got lucky. <laughs> he got a good commission. <laughs> you know, every field, I think, builds on, every, every great creative figure stands on the shoulder of giants, and I'm all for standing on the shoulder of giants. Uh, and I don't see how you can do the same in architecture. Uh, just put cleats on them. It's okay. It's okay. Um, when you see this, this is the kind of rendering that makes, that, that does it for me. I just think this is it. You, would you want this to be your school? I wouldn't even want to go have surgery, frankly. <laughs> um, it's so clinical, antiseptic, shiny. Glossy. You guys have got to stop rendering the world up at the float and glow. Like everything I do now is silhouette, dark, black, massive, no night lighting, heavy. Heavy in a cool way. Uh, I like this project, but if I had to pick a project uh, that had the same attitude, I think, as uh, uh, Chappelle's, it's Hani's. I think it's one of the smartest projects. Like if you were just going to say fuck you to that other building, <laughs> yeah, I'm tired of looking at you, and just and mass everything there, this is much smarter because of its cunning use of the relationship between opacity, transparency, and translucency. So it actually works to make it transparent because it uses the, the difference between the two together and he makes a screen. So if you are going to engage in a fun palace idea, if you're going to engage in a piece of mediated art, I don't think it's bad. I think that people are, it's a possibility. I don't think it's right for this school. But if you're going to do that, then this is the way I would do it. I would make the whole media screen. I would build all of the devices you build into it. Serious Vienna Fun Palace. So this is Cedric Price's Fun Palace for the Serious Vienna. I, it's a very smart project. Nobody likes him like this project. I, you know, if I had to pick between those two, that's the one I would pick. I don't like it. Neither one is my pick. Um, I don't know, why does everybody put uh, Matthew Barney? Is that Matthew Barney? Like, Matthew Barney kind of uses too much Vaseline. Uh, this is a very good title, Wolf. The applied idea. This is perhaps, in my mind, the most serious, best analysis of the site and the program. Uh, personally, as I'm going through this stuff, I'm thinking, really, I love this building. Um, it respects the old building. It actually has the courage to, to produce an entirely new urbanism for the city. Uh, at least, I, if I understand it correctly, you open it the one end completely. Um, and so it becomes a very different kind of... It, it's less about, I think, the building itself. Although, the degree of its rectitude, like, it seems almost too... The, the orthogonality in it, I think the hat idea was an interesting idea, but the orthogonality in it turns the piece that I think it's meant to be that into uh, ornamental. What's brilliant about this is it's treatment of the land. Because we have really got to stop turning buildings into land and land into buildings. I think it's just how much more that can we take. I just can't take it anymore. <laughs> so try something different. Turn it into salt cubes. Turn the land and building into sugar cubes. Just, Get off this turn land in the building and building the land. It really is. It's bad. Like, go, much as I love Peter's building in Spain, which you should all go see, because I went there from here for $25, like a lion air. Uh, one is enough. Uh, one is really enough. Um, and so I'm looking at this game and I, and I see the program and it's, you know, it's very smart. Uh, it's a mature project. Wolf is clearly the most important cosmopolitan architect ever to come out of Vienna. He, he, he's not as important as Loos as Loos in terms of history because Loos wrote and was a theorist. He may not be as smart as uh, what's the guy before you? I can't remember his name. <laughs> he's not as he's not as. By the way, I also think uh, I should have said this. 
Hani's scheme, Hani's ornamentation scheme, owes everything to Hohenlein. The Hohenlein's analysis of the, of the basic geometries of Biedermeier and traditional Austrian. Uh, so I'm looking at this, and it's, you know, I like the thing. And, um, and it's the kind of project Wolf is working all over the world. What I mean by that is uh, the, he's not, the, I'd say, the most successful business architect in the history of Viennese, maybe you can credit him, is Victor Gruen. Victor Gruen came to the United States, invented the shopping mall, for example, <laughs> wrote, <laughs> wrote three rules now. He said, never put a roof on a shopping mall because that allows the public property to become private property. And it's nobody, for a long time they didn't do it. And then all of a sudden the developer says, wait a minute, if I put a roof on this thing, I can tell the kids to shut up and who can come in and who can't go. And, but and Victor Gruen, I think he came back here after he retired. Uh, but he may be the most successful international practitioner. But Wolf is the person who's figured out a language about Baroque form and space and figured out how to internationalize it and particular, particularize it to various locations. So it is a true, it's not an international style, it's a very different thing now, it's a cosmopolitan style. And I think this project belongs to a cosmopolitan style, it can go anywhere. I really believe that. And I liked it until, also, it was odd for me that it's bigger on the bottom than the top. Like, I'm not used to that. I'm used to double cones or meeting, you know, I'm not used to asserting the ground, the importance of the ground from Wolf Press, even though he turns the ground into a kind of liquid. Certainly. Very interesting project. Till this. Uh, I, I, what's wrong with this building, by the way? I think that's, that the thing I learned from this competition is let's just paint this sucker white. Man, that would look so good. <laughs> Spray paint it white. But look, then, then, then he does this, and it really is it's a killer for me. Where to find that thing? Like, it's the glass. It's just, it's, it's wrong. It's, it's, it's an, appe it's an appeasement to infantile desires of students that don't know any better. But, you know, wouldn't it be great to run around in a glass thing? I mean, it's just a bad, it's a bad idea. <clears throat> so then, there's a lot of work, and I, I don't know. I, I didn't want to look at all that stuff. Look at the green, it's nice. So of the same, of the project of the same milk, I thought Jesse's was an interesting group more tectonic use of glass in organization, almost identical part T. All of the, uh, another internationalist project, this project could just as easily be his Taipei project or another cosmopolitan project. No interest whatsoever in a local situation at all, which is difficult here. To not be interested in the problem of Vienna is difficult. I don't think Vienna is ready for to join a cosmopolitan architecture. I think one of the things that's ruining the city right now is it's going that way too quickly without having to work through its psyche. There is no gain in any of these projects, much gain in any of these projects. These are fantastic renderings. I take this. Jesse's a good friend of mine. I just I have to show his things because he's a to show my thing. I didn't show Tom's because Tom's is just bad. Tom's is a bad ripoff of Cooper Union. And I thought to myself, Tom just wanted Wolf to win. That's what I really believe. I saw that, I thought, he did it to honor that he thought Wolf should be given the project. What the fuck? Why can't he just give the project to an architect? I don't get it. Like, did the, what's that guy's name? Emperor? What was your emperor? Franz Joseph? <laughs> yeah. Did he have competitions to get emperor, to get Beethoven's for symphonies for Beethoven? Did they have like a Huh? It was Franz only. Franz only? Franz only. Yeah, whoever. <laughs> You don't need, like, you got the best artist working for you, you let the guy do it. You know, Bernini didn't have to like his community. Like, I'm not an art historian, I'm a psychologist. So, um, anyway, there is, the scheme is interesting in the same way that the Psychoponic House was interesting. It's interesting for the specific problems that Jesse and Annika are working on in terms of how you make connections using tectonic elements that are multiplied to many, these kinds of Forms. I mean, I understand this perfectly well in terms of his work. I don't understand its merits in this particular case. Um, so I'll just... This is the only prime picture I could find of Next Enterprise. For some reason, does anybody know people at Next Enterprise? 
they must be broke. Like, they don't put anything on their website. They don't. You can't. They don't answer their goddamn phone. And I tell you what, I call these people. I, I I saw this thing and I thought this is kind of interesting. I saw this picture. The only picture I saw it reminded me of that I wanted to discuss. It. I thought maybe they have, they have that kind of relationship. I don't know. So this is you know, it looks pretty good. It's uh, it's kind of eggshelly. I, I like that. Eggshells are big now. Eggshell shapes. This is my favorite project. This is a project I don't know if it should have won. I'm not saying it should have won. I'm just saying I know for a fact it's the best part. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, the bird. <laughs> this is Eric Moss's project. See, I knew you were smart. And you knew I was smart. First of all, it does have glass, but in exactly the right place, instead of the ground. It uses glass. So it has. Uh, it, I think it's very peculiar to Vienna and the school. It has all sorts of echoes around the language of Vienna. He called it Three Birds on the String. It uses the glass in relationship to the uh, form to do two things. One is to localize the problem, but at the same time is to raise the question of this cosmopolitanization of the ground. So it's a building that's right in the conflict of where architecture is today politically, I think, and psychologically. Sorry about this. Um, I, you know, it's worked through beautifully. I'm not going to, I'm running too late. Uh, it has qualities like the, for Hadix mass. It has a, has a figural quality that lets your psychology and imagination uh, make something of it that's not there, which I think is a great idea for a school. It doesn't indulge the silly fantasies of children and students. Um, it, in fact, it is the most hated like project I've ever seen him do. Um, and if you know me at all, you will... A beautiful model. And what could be better than that? So these are Hades. Hades has this quality. You see this drawing, and then you see you know, the angel catcher, and then you see this construction element, and all of a sudden it becomes poetry. And that is a profound thing to happen. And that is a profound thing to do for a city. Or you see the mother of the suicide, and you see this formwork for a concrete point. You see all the nails coming in? It's fantastic. And so to be able to do that, it's a bit like pop art does. When you go to a pop art show and every single you walk out, turns into art. To get the entire city to become awake to its banalities and, and its everydayness in, in terms of its deep spirituality, I think that's a really great thing to do. And I think it would really be good for me to so this is the kind of thing I'm very interested in. This is David Smith, pure geometric form. Very, uh, but I'm, I'm about to ruin this sculpture for you. So how many of you like this sculpture? Close. If you like it, close your eyes. Because when I see this sculpture, what I feel is this. <laughs> and I think uh, Eric's project has that quality. It looks like it's architecture, animated architecture, not a representation of animated architecture. It uses a combination of structural ideas in terms of the wire and the glass ground. And it's really, it, I, it would probably actually suck to be in. But, you know, you've, you've, you've been in buildings that suck already for a century, what do you care? Another century. It wouldn't be the most fun to be. Now, as those of you who know, I think these are the greatest works of public art. I don't like public but I think if I ever had to say what was, I think these are the greatest works of public art ever done. And uh, I wrote about that in, when I was thinking about Peter Nerva's uh, life. And you know, he puts them up and he actually cheats Vienna. He's the guy. I mean, he says, oh, I'll put them up for a week. You know, they won't be there very long. You know? and then gonna, they'll be there longer than all of us. I wanted to get them moved to Los Angeles because uh, they are us. They are anonymous, figural, massive. They're the kind of architecture that plus the hating that I'd like to see, that I think is actually would be a great thing for architecture to take a look at now, particularly for Vienna. And I thought to myself when I saw this rendering, if you're going to win a competition, only show it after nuclear war. <laughs> <laughs> that is the best way to get somebody to like your competition. You know, render it. This is bound to win. Thanks. Oh, can, uh, I mean, this is going to sound funny. 
Can I get a copy of this for Eric? <laughs> he is my boss. <laughs> By the way, sorry. Are there any questions? Do you make do you make videos or something? We get Eric just wanted to see this guy. I did my analysis of Eric Moss has been more closely related to Bruce Nauman. I don't know if you know his work at all. But there's an incredible like Bruce Nauman is an artist who walks through the world and instead of making marks, he just rearranges stuff. Just pulls the legs off of something, sticks it on top, takes a neon sign, stretches it out. For no reason whatsoever, just as an existential passing. I always think Eric is like that. So, is there any, let me ask you a question if you're not going to ask anyone. Uh, is there a reason to bother? Is there, or sh the, the thing that would help, or not help it, I want you to go back. Go look at these websites. Look at a website that says 25 of the most beautiful university buildings, 25 of the most beautiful concert halls. They're all over the site. And you look at that and see and tell me how you judge those. If it's, I like this, I don't like that, that's pretty, that, you know. If you don't, if there's nothing at stake, if you cannot formulate a way in your mind where this architecture is supposed to affect, affect the way people live their lives, who I am, who you are, who we are to each other, who they are, if, you know, my relationship to the other. If it's not about that, what is the point? And your answer? <laughs> See, I'm a tricky teacher. <laughs> I agree with that. There you go. That's what I, I agree with. Who doesn't agree? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Any questions? With that, I'm going to go do some people. Which is another thing I started in the VN. Like, I never drank my whole life before I started coming to VN. I started drinking. And it turns your hair white. <laughs> I thought you were supposed to drink it, but you, you put it here and you let it go down. Okay, it's fantastic. I, I love you all. Thank you all for coming.